Good morning, Church in the City. This is David Corey out in the country in Elsa Craig, Ontario, where there is an actual blizzard taking place. My wife thought that if I preached out here in the blizzard, that it might make the sermon shorter. Now, I don't know if that's something about my preaching or how she feels about it. Anyway, here's what I'm going to do. is I'm going to preach right here. My sermon is entitled, Joy to the World. So here we are, January 9th. Christmas now definitely passed. And what a Christmas it was. I mean, we arrived here in Canada on December 16th. And between exposure to kids and grandkids, we spent from December 19th to January 3rd quarantined in a house with no Christmas tree and no presents under the tree. And so we discovered the real meaning of Christmas. It's actually about gifts. Well, okay, not really. It really is true that Christmas is all about Christ. But Netflix does help when you're quarantined. But now that Christmas is past, I want us to consider one of my very favorite Christmas carols at the heart of this message. You know it. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Okay, I won't quit my day job. But it goes on, it says, Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. And then it goes on, Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Man, it sounds like all creation, the human, the animal, the material creation, join together rejoicing in the coming of the King. I know, I know, when we sing this Christmas carol, we're thinking of the birth of the holy infant. Oh, the tender manger scene of that first Christmas night. But the hymn was written by that great 18th century hymn writer, Isaac Watts, whose works include When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. And the carol is actually based on scripture, Psalm 96 in part. Let the heavens rejoice, it says, Psalm 96, verse 11. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. And let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Wow, it's Christmas, full of joy and singing. Let heaven and nature sing. But now listen to this. Listen to this. The last couple of verses here. Uh, verse 12 and 13. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. And he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Joy to the world. It was never really conceived as a Christmas song. It was written, actually, for a collection of poems called the Psalms of David. In those days, uh, Reformed Christianity in particular would sing the Psalms. And, and so this was a, a psalm to be sung. But it does have an Advent theme. Far from being about the first coming of the Lord, it declares the joy of the second coming. When Christ comes to judge the world with righteousness and faithfulness and justice, joy to the world, the Lord is come. You see, that's part of Advent too. Not just away in a manger, but the coming that's far away from the manger. Joy to the world. But let's face it, joy is pretty hard to come by this year, isn't it? I mean, we're facing environmental crisis. No question about that. How many of you have ever heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? It's uh, one of five islands of plastic accumulation, uh, zones of plastic accumulation in the world's oceans. 
located halfway between Hawaii and California. And this patch alone covers an estimated surface area of 1.6 million square kilometers. That's an area twice the size of Texas or three times the size of France. We are facing environmental crisis. I mean, severe weather events. I mean, we, we followed the deadly tornadoes that caused devastation in Kentucky and, and five other states um, in those, in those uh, couple of weeks in, in uh, December. And, and, we, and they came just a few months after a 7.2 magnitude earthquake rocked Haiti. And, and Category 4 Hurricane Ida whipped through the eastern United States and Atlantic Canada. Um, FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell said uh, that the agency is preparing for severe weather events of similar magnitude. She said, this is going to be our new normal. And the effects we're seeing from climate change are the crisis of our generation. <laughs> Man, environmental degradation, climate change, fires and floods, and of course, infrastructure. Even in, in Belgium, we were following uh, with pain what was going on in British Columbia as, as floods inundated the lower mainland and, and, and devastated the BC agricultural economy. It turns out the December floods are related to the June forest fires and that devoured so much uh, uh, of, of, the, of the, the, the forestry that, that took away the roots that hold the water that descends from the mountains. And of course, all of this is, accumulates in, in the kinds of floods that we've seen. And so, as a result, all the McDonald's in Japan have limited sales to small fries because the potato shortage they face as a result of the BC uh, disruption. Incredible. It's amazing how one thing is connected to another, is connected to another. And of course, we're in a world of wars and rumors of wars. Afghanistan, Burma, Ethiopia, Sudan, Russia, and Ukraine. What's going to happen there? Uh, China... China and the world. I mean, it goes on and on with the human suffering of large-scale migration. Poland and Belarus and this showdown at the border. And, 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 oh, yes. <laughs> and one more thing, perhaps a little too close to home for all of us. Can you say it with me? COVID! Oh, my goodness. Everybody in my family, except for me, has had COVID this Christmas. And, and how many of you are just sick and tired, had it up to like past here with COVID? How many of you are glad that you tuned in for church today? You know, a day of encouragement. Hey, pastor, keep preaching those encouraging words. Listen, we are not meant to be the doomsayers in this world. We're not called to, to be naysayers in this world. The real joy of Christmas is about the second coming, and we call it hope. We're called to be dealers in hope. You know, on New Year's morning, I woke up with an immense, powerful sense of divine hope. Like, like, not just, uh, I felt kind of, it was a nice day, I felt hopeful, I had a good sleep. No, no, I sensed God speaking to me about his care for you, his care for me, his care for this world. There is hope because our God is the God of hope. And so you and I are called to be dealers in hope, merchants of hope. Uh, you bring me your discouragement, your darkness, and your fear, and I'll trade it in for hope. Good, solid, Christian hope. You know, we're called to be shock absorbers in the world. That's what we're supposed to be. People bring us their pain and their frustration, and, and we absorb it, and we pass that on to the Lord. And meanwhile, we pass on hope into the darkness, hope into the pain. 
joy into uncertainty and peace into the storm. Listen to what the Bible says. I'm reading here from Romans chapter 8, and I'm starting in verse 19. I want you to track with me what the Apostle Paul says. He says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought in to the freedom and glory of the children of God. Look, we live in a broken world. That's no secret. And all of creation is waiting for the new creation to come, for the new humanity to be revealed, ultimately for a new heavens and a new earth in which dwell righteousness, Peter says, for peace. We're waiting for shalom, for wholeness. No more let sins and sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Now, how did we get into this mess? Romans 8 told us that the whole of creation has been subjected to frustration. And that's not just the human creation here. That, that's everything else. The animals, the plants, the, the fields and floods, the rocks, hills and, and plains. It's all broken. But why? How did it get that way? For the answer, we've got to go back to Genesis. Adam and Eve had been warned about eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but being good humans, they practiced rationalization. How many of you have rationalized your way into really bad choices? Well, they rationalized their way into doing it, taking a bite of the fruit of that tree. And when they did, all creation died. It came under a curse. Here it is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. And your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. You know, even the dynamic of the husband-wife relationship is broken because of because of the fall. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, <clears throat> you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fruit, food from it all the days of your life. <laughs> it's broken. Have you ever uh, bent a wheel like on a bicycle or, or the rim on the, the, the tire of your car. Uh, as the great theologian Linda Ronstadt used to sing, some say the heart is just like a wheel. When you bend it, you can't mend it. And, and that's what happened to creation. <laughs> Beautiful as it can be, it will never be what it should be because it's been bent out of shape. And once you've bent it, you just can't seem to mend it. And, 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 and so we're out of alignment with our creator. And we're under the hand, the creation is under the hand of a cruel, greedy taskmaster called humanity who multiplies its suffering. Well, David, where's the joy in all this? I thought this was joy to the world. I'm getting depressed listening to you. Well, I'm here to declare to you that there is hope in the soon coming of Christ. And it's called hope because of Christmas. The real joy of Christmas is based on the first coming. We call it redemption. That's a great word, isn't it? Here's how the Apostle Paul describes the curse in Romans chapter 8. He says in verse 22 to 25, 
Romans 8, 22 to 25, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. That's where we stand. Under the curse, but in the hope. You see, in this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulations troubles and sorrows, but you can be of good cheer. Come on, put on a happy face, for I have overcome the world. And Christmas changes it all. It turns the tide. It creates the countercurrent. Something changed at Christmas. Hope was born. And that's why this is an incredible New Year's message. Guys, we're beginning a year pregnant with hope. Christ was born. He lived a life of healing, hope giving, a life of redemption. And here's how Paul put it to the Galatians. He said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Galatians 3.13, Christ has become the curse. And on that pole, on that tree, on that cross, Christ broke the curse that has held creation in its grip and humanity in its thrall. He, he redeemed us all from the curse of the brokenness of sin. When he stopped, uh, stepped into this sin-cursed world, the redemption began right there on that first Christmas in the incarnation. God stepped in here. He became flesh. He pitched his tent with us. He came to live in our neighborhood, uh, Eugene Peterson says. And, and you know what? He continued that work of redemption as he touched broken lives and and, and lives that had been cast off and healed the sick and he raised the dead. And he continued it on the cross where he decidedly broke the curse and the resurrection where he was declared victorious. And it continues to this day as he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. You see, redemption is a process. It started that first Christmas. It continues year after year in your life, in my life, and it will continue until that day when the process is finally completed. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 22, verses three to five. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. And they will see his face and the name, his name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. He will turn our scars into stars. It starts here. I'm part of it. You're part of it. Haven't you experienced something beautiful of what Jesus comes to redeem in your life, in my life? He's doing it in you and in me, and he continues to do it. And it starts here, but it ends there. He rules the world with truth and grace. It starts now, but it finds ultimate fulfillment then. And so, I hope you'll never sing joy to the world the same way. Listen to the fourth verse. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. It's hope. I pray for you that hope will be birthed in your heart 
today and that you will carry it in the face of every challenge of the coming year. God bless you, Church in the City.